The Bible says, be not deceived. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. All right, it's 4 p.m. on Wall Street. Do you know where your money is? How much should I invest? I really look at some direction. Should I hold on to my house as an investment for my future? Or what should we do to have money that we're putting aside? Welcome to Financial Issues, where we align reality with truth. Conservative talk radio you can count on. Financial issues that you need to know. We face a disintegrating economy, a weakened defense, and an energy policy based on the sharing of scarcity. We will simply apply to government the common sense that we all use in our daily lives. Now, here's your host, Dan Celia. Good morning. Welcome back to Financial Issues. After a wonderful long weekend, at least wonderful here in the Northeast, we had wonderful weather. Uh, it, was a, it was a great weekend. And I hope all of you, as I said on the program yesterday, the pre-recorded program yesterday, I hope we were all flying our flags proudly. I made it a point to thank my neighbors for putting their flags out and encouraging them to fly it all year long. So uh, we'll see. But hopefully we, we did that in uh, memory of those serving and those that have served, and we sure do appreciate that. It was a great weekend. A lot of economic news coming out. We want to get to that. I want to thank everybody, by the way, who emailed me in reference to the opening segment of yesterday's program. And we, yes, we will. I believe the podcast is up, but we're going to try to get uh, the video of that opening segment. We actually have... um, in, in the uh, video, if you watched it on uh, one of the TV networks, the video quality, they actually put in the wrong video that we did. It was the right content. Uh, it was just the wrong video. Uh, the one on YouTube will be a lot clearer. And you actually see um, Ronald Reagan making that speech that I referred to in my opening segment. But thank you for that. It was... Uh, I I was glad I was able to do that. Anyway, lots of economic news coming out. We're going to get to that right after the next segment. Uh, Right after this segment, we're going to get to the economic news, what we can expect, what we've already gotten so far this morning, how that's uh, looking, what that's all about. I'm going to read between the lines on the numbers just to give you some accurate input as to what the durable good numbers uh, truly looks like. So we are going to uh, do that at the next segment. Right now, we have a um, long missed anyway oh a well she wasn't i won't say she was a a wall she was busy traveling and vacationing i guess i'm not i'm not certain but we sure have missed sandy uh rios sandy rios in the morning she is director of governor affairs for american family association and uh, we sure appreciate her and she's back as a matter of fact folks we're going to start um having sandy we usually have her we used to have her on mondays we're going to start having her on tuesdays uh that'll avoid any of the, you know, three-day weekends and some other things. It makes it easier uh, for all of us. So welcome, Sandy. Glad you're back. Good morning, Dan. It's good to be back. I was uh, actually, see, I was up in Canada where oh. things cost about three times as much as they do mm-hmm. here. You yeah. know that place? <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> anyway, I, I, my rest was uh, diapering, bathing, feeding, a reading to... And playing with three little grandchildren. Oh, so, well, well yeah. it doesn't get me any better than that. It, it doesn't. Five, no, two, doesn't. and seven months. So uh, oh, well, I can't. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, well, anyway, my I daughter, came back to rest. My daughter is temporarily moved in with us, and she has four children all <laughs> under the age of four, four and a half. <laughs> four and a half's the oldest. So How's that going, Dan? <laughs> um I'm starting to look forward to traveling a little bit, <laughs> which uh, it's it's been great. It's great having them, but y- you know you can imagine it is uh, a, a change for two empty nesters. It, so anyway. it is. It is definitely a change. I, one quick story: my uh, my grandson Moses is five, and uh, he he actually prays some very fine prayers. I'm very mm-hmm. proud. His dad's a pastor, and so one night we were praying with him, and he said. Uh, Dear Jesus, and he prays a lot of forgive us for our sins, a lot of really solid biblically think, biblical things. And then he said, and, and Lord, thank you so much for making us aliens. And I'm, I'm thinking, well, he, he must have heard a sermon the, on the King right, James right. Version. You know, we were once aliens. And I was pretty impressed, you know. Then he went on to say, because 
space is all that matters. <laughs> so I thought, um, uh, we're going to have to do a little tease. You know, he's right. into Star Wars and all of these. Right, right. Uh, because space is all that matters. That, oh, dear me. <laughs> that's funny. That's we got great. some work to do. That's great. That's, uh, that's good stuff. Yeah. Um, he'll appreciate hearing that story someday. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. Yeah. Well, what's happening in, why, let's start with the CIA. Um, for for uh, a guy that served in the military, the capacity in which I was uh, blessed to serve, uh, it's extremely disturbing news coming out of the, um, the CIA. But uh, tell us what you know about um, what the events of the day and the week are going to look like there. Yeah, well, uh, the president, of course, made a surprise visit to Afghanistan. I think that no one is confused about why. Uh, mm -hmm. He is really in a firestorm over the treatment of veterans in the VA hospitals. Mm -hmm. And we already know about all the social engineering that he's doing in the military. I mean, he is very passionate about gay rights, transgender rights, uh, cross-dressing rights. He is just very adamant about that. And yet he shows very little regard, really, uh, to just men and women who serve and uh, that that's their main focus. It's just been a, a hotbed of social engineering. And then, of course, now we know they're, they're, our men and women are being neglected in terms of they're dying because they're not getting proper medical care. So the president is now on a campaign, I think, to rehabilitate his uh, image. And so he flew to Afghanistan. And now here's the ironic thing. Uh, in the process of doing that, the White House staff sent out a list of people meeting with the president, and in it they included... Uh, the name of the CIA chief in Afghanistan, his real name. He's an undercover CIA operative, Dan. He's the highest ranking one in Kabul. And they revealed his name to thousands of media, including foreign media. 6,000. So, the yes. email went to over 6,000. That's yeah. amazing. And anyway, then they tried, ahead. so then they tried to pull it back. They sent, it, sent out a list that did not have his name on it, but mm -hmm. it's too late. Right. And so I don't, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. I guess we just have to wait to see if they think they're going to have to recall him. Uh, but it's just, you know, it reminds me, recall, if you will, that this same White House, mm -hmm. after C SEAL Team 6, Navy SEAL Team 6, went in mm -hmm. and uh, raided uh, and killed Osama bin Laden, it was the White House who revealed where the Navy SEAL Team 6 live with their families in Florida. Mm -hmm. They actually made that public. Mm -hmm. So um, it's just one really d uh, national security disaster after another. Interestingly, too, uh, Karzai refused to meet with Obama when he was in Afghanistan. So uh, he, he's going to, you know, an election is coming up soon, so Karzai will be out. Maybe Karzai's just trying to save his own life because, you know, any probably perception that he's buddying up to the American administration with the Taliban, they'll be left in charge once we pull out. There's no question about it. Yeah. Uh, so that's probably what's happening there. Another Speaking story. Speaking of elections, go, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to actually I was going to talk about elections. I, okay. I know while I was in Canada that, you know, all the talk was that the Tea Party did so poorly last week yeah. with Mitch McConnell trouncing Matt Bevan in Kentucky mm -hmm. and a couple of other races. But uh, but Dan, you know, on the on the Mitch McConnell, Matt Bevan race, just so people know, I I already knew that Matt was in trouble for other reasons. And so people had backed away from him. I'm not saying they should have, mm -hmm. but I'm saying that he. he Somebody was able to muddy his reputation enough mm -hmm. that the uh, support of him really waned, and he got very little money from the Tea Party. So that really wasn't. I can't. I don't think that you can uh, make any proclamations mm -hmm. about the health of the Tea Party based on that race. Yet people did. Um, and tomorrow, of course, is a big uh, uh, runoff in Texas. It's not a runoff, but it's a it's the primary in Texas. And the Tea Party has all kinds of, uh, of candidates that they expect to win. One of them is the lieutenant governor candidate. They're challenging David Dewhurst, who is the longtime lieutenant governor in uh, Texas. And you may remember his name because he is the candidate that Ted Cruz beat out in the Republican primary for Senate. Uh, Dewhurst is a longtime operative in the Republican Party, but he is uh, more uh, aligned with establishment uh, then real strong conservatives. So it looks mm. like Senator Dan Patrick may be the victor in that. We don't know, but that's that's what it looks like today. Yeah. Yeah. And then there are several other races there. So the Tea Party is going to be really flexing its muscles tomorrow in Texas. Mm. So uh, and, well, <clears throat> and then we have elections in Europe that are, you know, there was an article this morning, I don't know if you saw it in reference to uh, our allies in Europe uh, concerned about President Obama's timidity as the 
headline is, I've been concerned about his timidity, and that's putting it kindly, um, over Kerry and Obama. But it looks like our allies are jumping on that as well. Now, I don't think they have a whole lot of room to speak when it comes to Russia and the Ukraine. But um, nevertheless, uh, there's some concern about that, which goes to, of course, the credibility, the might, the strength uh, of the United States of America as well. So uh, it'll be interesting. We have elections uh, coming up and um, what what all that how that's going to all. Oh, shape up. Yeah. Um, Well, you know, there's a this it's it. What's happening right now in the world is unpredictable, tumultuous, almost everywhere. And, uh, you know, France and uh, uh, England. uh, What was the other country? Uh, uh, Denmark. Uh, Mm -hmm. The the anti-immigration move is so powerful. In fact, uh, Britain just had a real upset. And the EU-UK Independence Party, led by a guy named Nigel Farage, uh, scored huge gains. And his party, as I understand it, now, Dana, I'm not an expert on this. I'm just, re- I'm just gathering bits of information myself now. But I know that it's, uh, they are anti-EU. In fact, Nigel Farage had on his socks uh, a pound, uh, the image for the pound, the, uh, the mm-hmm. British pound. They want to they wanna shake loose of the EU. And so do the people in France. They're sick of the EU. Mm-hmm. And so there's a, the only country that uh, prevailed um, in terms of uh, acceptance of the EU, a party that accepted the EU was, was Germany. Mm-hmm. And that's the only one in the elections over the weekend that, uh, that prevailed. The others are just rebelling against it. And so uh, I, that'll be really, in, uh, in France, it's Marine Le Pen. Marine Le Pen. Mm-hmm. She's, uh, she's a far-right leader of an anti-immigration party. And uh, they said that it's become the strongest party in France now. See, you know, that shouldn't be too much of a surprise when we think about it. You know, remember that France had this, in Paris, they had a huge rally six months ago against uh, the uh, same-sex marriage law. Did you mm-hmm. remember that, Dan? I do, I do. I, I, I talked about it, yes. I yeah, so there, there's a strong, there's a move. There's a move underfoot. There is a bit of a rebellion going on and a war, just an every, whether it's an all-out shooting war, I don't necessarily mean that, but an ideological war Almost everywhere we look, there's conflict. And interesting in France, because a year and a half earlier uh, than that was the protest for a stronger and bigger socialized uh, government. Uh, and, you know, they, they uh, quickly elected the uh, socialists. Yeah. And, you know, now, now they're saying, whoops. Hmm. Yeah, it's not working out Don't know so if well. That was a good idea. Yeah, yeah, Fran- yeah Francois Hollande. Yeah, mm-hmm. and so and now he's lost a lot of his party came in third actually in France. Mm-hmm. So yeah. um, I don't know, you know, whether they can actually deconstruct the EU. You know, that's the big vision of the global leftists: is one world government. You know, united by this. I think uh, the Europeans were sucked into this, Dan, because they thought it would make them an economic power that could compete with the United States. Uh, and uh, they've, they've, what they have found is that really the ones pushing it, the ones behind the scenes, wanted a power grab. They wanted to control people. The control that they have exercised over the various European countries has just become amazing. And uh, people of Europe are not happy with it. They've got enough independence left, and then they're saying, wait a minute. But I don't know if they can pull it back. I mean, they've had so yeah. much immigration. It's like our country. We are at a tipping point. Well, they're not going to, Europe's never going to pull it back in my opinion, because, you know, when you have uh, such a, such a large amount of the voting block, you know, dependent upon the government, uh, that, that dramatically impacts. I know they want to see, see them, you know, get out of the European union. Uh, I, you know, I understand that I get that, uh, and get back, uh, and, and, you know, the way I look at it, I think that would be good for a lot of countries, but there's going to be a lot of pain. It's not going to come without a lot of pain. And they're not thinking about that. And I don't know that they're going to really want to bear uh, the pain when it's all said and done. But we'll we'll have to watch and see. It's very interesting to see how uh, things waver on a monthly basis over there. Um, you talk about flip-flopping. I mean, the whole Eurozone seems to be very, very good at that on a regular and always have been. So. Hey, um, hey, Dan, anyway. one, one, yes. quick one other wrinkle. Yep. Did you hear Russia now is uh, selling their natural gas to China? They won yes. whatever contract it was. And so yeah, now I we have virtually about, been cut out of that. Well, I talked about that at, at length um, yesterday, in the uh, last week. And the interesting part about it is 
it took him 10 years to finally get to that point. There has to be a reason. And Putin uh, needs some money and certainty that he's going to get rid of his uh, only real resource. Sandy, thank you so much for being with us. I'm a widow. I've worked for a bank for 31 years, and I've been retired now for 10 years. Myrtle Norris comments on her experience with the AFA Foundation. I had a lot of financial questions, and Dan Celia was, um, he answered my questions, and he helped me with a lot of decisions that I made. And then the charitable gift came up, and he explained that to me. And so I contacted Diane O'Neill, and she walked me through everything that I needed. I decided to get it, and I'm sure glad I did, because I know now that money is in a place that I know God wants it to be, and also get my monthly income from it. I believe in the AFA and what they're doing, because they're working for us. Learn how the AFA Foundation can work for you by calling 800-326-4543, extension 345, or visit afafoundation.net. Welcome back, American Family Radio Network, Financial Issues. I'm Dan Celia. Of course, we just had Sandy Rio. Sandy Rio's in the morning. Sandy, of course, is Director of Governmental Affairs out of Washington, D.C. for American Family Association, and we appreciate Sandy coming on the program and giving us some insights and updates, and, and uh, we, she is here on Tuesdays, uh, the first segment on Tuesdays, right after her pre-program, Sandy Rios in the morning. You hear her the hour uh, before my program. So uh, just I didn't have time to kind of close that segment out because uh, we ran it right up against uh, the break, and of course— I say this all the time, it doesn't mean much to, to you guys, but all of my breaks are hard breaks. I cannot move them or change them because we have so many, you know, we have other networks plus TV networks picking up the program and they got to be on, you know, everybody's got to be breaking at the exact same time and have that programmed in. So unfortunately, the downside to that is I don't have some of the flexibility that I've had, that I had years ago, which was so nice, um, particularly when you're doing an interview. So anyway, I uh, apologize for that, and that's why I didn't get to, to finish that. Anyway, we got Durable Good Numbers uh, came out this morning, and it's, uh, you know, the, the markets like the Durable Good Numbers this morning when they came out. Uh, they, they were up, uh, they were expecting a minus 8 tenths of 1%. They got Durable Good Orders up uh, 8 tenths of 1%. Now, when you factor in, or t- I'm sorry, take out transportation, that would be, uh, airliners and those kinds of things, big, big, big uh, defense project kinds of things that are big ticketed items. When you take that out, uh, durable good orders was a negative of about 1.8%. But what they are saying to have a headline number, the theory being the headline number was expected to be negative. So when the headline number is in any kind of positive territory, frankly, zero probably would have been okay for the markets because we had an, excuse me, an unusually high durable good numbers um, last month. So, you know, uh, they, they, the markets feel pretty good about this. Um, The two things I don't like is business investment fell 1.2%. Uh, the markets don't seem to be concerned about that. I'm extremely concerned about that. I I believe, just me, I believe it's one of the most important numbers inside durable goods. So what we need to see is business investment increasing. Now, business investment means, it doesn't mean businesses investing. It means businesses doing things like hiring people, doing things like uh, buying new hardware, software for their computer systems or whatever, adding new robotics into their um, manufacturing, maybe adding new equipment onto their line, those kinds of things, maybe needing to build an addition to expand their manufacturing, maybe building an addition for warehousing or trucking or whatever it is. All of those things are considered business investments. Now, We know business investment has stunk for a long time. It's been one of my biggest issues. One of the biggest reasons for that. Well, we know that the Federal Reserve has $2.8 trillion, $2.7 trillion in reserves. 
Federal Reserve in reserves. They got $2.8 trillion sitting around doing nothing. Doing nothing. $2.8 trillion. Oh, it's earning them a little bit of interest. It's doing nothing. And I want to ask everybody out there, how many people have you heard talk about that? Have you heard all the conservative um, uh, media talking about it? Have you heard the financial networks talking about the fact that there's uh, $2.7 trillion sitting around doing nothing? Have you heard anybody? Who have you heard talking about it other than I talked about it last week when the numbers came out? Do you understand how critically concerning that is and should be, I'm sure it is, to the Fed? It means that business investment is critically down. Business investors and businesses are not borrowing money. Individuals are not borrowing money. Small businesses not borrowing money. There is no reason for the banking system to tap on the Federal Reserve's window of lending and say, <clears throat> we need a couple billion dollars out of that $2.7 trillion. And they, they get it, of course, if they ask for it. And if they, they're not going to ask for it, obviously, unless they need it. And they don't need it unless lenders or unless borrowers are coming. Does that concern anybody? Hmm. Is that a red flag about the future of the economy to anybody? I don't know. It would appear not. It is to me. But nevertheless, we've got the major indices slightly in positive territory for the year. Think about these markets, folks. If you never got in the market January 1st, you would have missed out on right now about two-tenths of 1%. For all the ups and downs and sideways and volatility that we've had, the markets haven't moved much. So that is what is happening in uh, durable good numbers that came out. Now, at 9 o'clock Eastern time, it's already 9 o'clock Eastern time, so this number should be out. I didn't even pick it up. But uh, uh, Case-Shiller home prices... And let me just see if I can uh, check it out. They came out at 9 o'clock. And, yes, uh, they rose 9 tenths of 1%, almost 1% for the month of March when you look at city by city. So uh, they're up slightly. That's good news. If you're buying a home, I think it is. I would suspect we're going to see a pullback on that since housing is slowing. Uh, The biggest gains were showed in Las Vegas uh, at about 21%. That's the biggest gain nationally since the peak of the crisis. But uh, all in all, we've got an increase of about 12.4% year over year uh, in home prices. Also coming out at 10 o'clock Eastern time this morning is the government consumer confidence number. You all know that's a number I like, and that's a number we're going to be watching very closely. So consumer confidence numbers will be out at 10 o'clock. We'll take a look at that. The Michigan sentiment number comes out on Friday consumer sentiment number. Right now, the consumer confidence number is, is uh, the forecast is that it ticks down a bit. Tomorrow, we get uh, the mortgage index. That's coming. That the, that's the only real news tomorrow. On Thursday, of course, we get initial jobless claims. They will be out on Thursday, so we'll have to watch that again uh, coming out on Thursday, initial job claims. But the big news of the week There's two big numbers. Uh, Obviously, consumer sentiment on Friday is a number I like. But the big news is the second look at GDP. Now, the forecast for GDP for the second look was a negative half of 1%. I suspect that forecast is going to tick up based on a... The durable good numbers that just came out. Because the durable good numbers obviously adds, does add to GDP. So I would suspect that uh, we basically have had two back-to-back GDP, or I'm sorry, two back-to-back durable good numbers uh, coming out. So the forecast of a negative half of 1%, I would expect is probably uh, going to tick up a bit. We'll have to wait and see. But that's a big number. This is the second look at the first quarter. 
pending home sales also come out Thursday. That's going to be interesting based on the numbers that we've received so far this year, uh, pending home sales. Also on Friday, we get um, two, two numbers that I like an awful lot, and that is personal income and personal spending. Personal income is expected to be pretty much the same as where it was last month. Um, personal spending is to be down two-tenths or one-tenth personal income, uh, a plus three-tenths of 1%, which is where it was last month. So no change in personal income according to the forecast. But that's coming out Friday. Then we get the Michigan sentiment number uh, on Friday as well. So that's what we're going to expect, economic news. 866-300-9298. Listen, it's been a three-day weekend. Nobody here on Monday. Yesterday, I know you've got a lot of penned-up questions. Again, I want to thank you uh, all who... Um, appreciated uh, our first segment yesterday, Memorial Day. Uh, it was, uh, I really, really, and I, I, I urged everybody, I think I did, <clears throat> to go back and find Ronald Reagan's 1985 inaugural address and listen to it. I've listened to it many, many times. But one of the comments that I got was uh, that it made this person so homesick for leadership and dignity in the presidency. And uh, boy, I'll tell you, it will do that for you, if nothing else. 866-300-9298, 866-300-9298. If you want to weigh in with your comments, if you call right now, you're going to be the first one to get on the air as soon as we go to calls. I'm going to go to calls as soon as the board uh, fills up, 866 300 92, 98, if you've got a question for me, I'm sure a lot of you are extending this week uh, as a holiday, I would imagine. I hope you are. That's great if you are. Uh, Federal workers, uh, I'm sorry, the Fed working some changes into their numbers on their stress test. And one of the things they're finding out and one of the things that came to light is that Bank of America made a little error in calculating the regulatory capital. They missed it by $4 billion. Somebody forgot to move a decimal point or something. But anyway, $4 billion calculation error on their capital. Remember, the regulatory authority says you got to have X amount of capital. Uh, get it, you know, and you got to have it. And uh, they, they made a little error there. So I'm sure they're going to work that out. Also uh, coming out this morning in the Wall Street Journal, talking about bonds uh, that have produced better returns are those bonds that have been a lot less risky. So those bonds aren't doing as well. Interesting. So if you're in high yield bonds and you are in some government bonds, you probably overall your return on the year is better in the lower risk bonds, the government bonds. That would probably be because that's where the flight from equities is going. The flight from equities is not going over to high yield or the more risky bonds. That would kind of defeat the purpose of getting out of equities. So that's not where it's going. It's going in the safer bonds. And apparently that has led to these bonds outperforming those that are more risky. 866-300-9298. Maybe having phone problems. Uh, yeah, it looks. I mean, I mean, I keep seeing lines light up and and go off. So uh, maybe there's some sort of issue with the phone software. But if you keep trying, we'd appreciate it. Um, that'll help us. 866-300-9298. 866-300-9298. You're listening to Financial Issues. I'm Dan Celia. So. The U.S. doctor, Christian doctor that was shot in Pakistan, was, a, was an American citizen. He was shot in front of his family. He was over there to serve uh, on a temporary mission trip in, a, in an emergency clinic. He was shot and killed, unfortunately. And um, this is a country that we continue to give billions of dollars to. Doesn't that make you feel good? So your taxpaying dollars continues to go there. Uh, this is just absolutely pathetic. Anyway, uh, we continue We continue to see that um, happening. My big story of the week is going to be this, and I'm going to do a little bit more research on this, and I'm going to try to put out uh, my own story on it. But it looks like the EPA 
You know, first of all, let me just preface this story by saying this. You've all heard me talk about the worst piece of legislation ever to hit the floor of Congress. <clears throat> and that was the cap and trade bill. And you've heard me say over and over again, and it, without a doubt, it's the worst piece of legislation. It was nothing more, nothing more than an incredible power grab and social control to the likes of which is going to make Obamacare seem like uh, kids play. It is, was an incredibly harmful bill. It was attempted to pass. It failed, thankfully. But it went away. And it was pretty amazing that it went away. All the Democrats that were the progressives that were fiercely driving this bill all seemed to just quietly disappear. At the time, I said, doesn't that scare anybody but me? And I said, the reason that it quietly went away is because President Obama said to his progressive friends, no worries, don't be concerned. We're just going to hand this off, this bill, to the EPA, and the EPA is going to take care of it. Well, the EPA this week is going to unveil its climate proposal. Its climate proposal. Now, remember, we know the president is incredibly zealous and passionate for climate change. Wouldn't it be nice if he spent as much time on, on, on the VA scandal, the IRS scandal on Benghazi, as he has climate change? But there's a very scary piece of this. The Obama administration will next week unveil the cornerstone of his climate change initiative. I'm reading from the Wall Street Journal. And will propose a rule amid it allowing states allowing states to use cap-and-trade systems, renewable energy, and other measures to meet aggressive goals for reducing carbon emissions by existing power plants. He's allowing states to use cap-and-trade rules. Now, If you live in the state of Georgia, state of Georgia being the worst as far as coal emissions, then Alabama, Indiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Texas, Arizona, Michigan, and Kentucky, they're the 10 worst states. He's going to allow them to use cap and trade. This is the beginning of the power graph. Oh, he's going to make it seem like it's the states. But you better put your seatbelt on. Because in the next two years, this is going to cost us a lot of money. We'll be right back. Hi, this is Dan Celia for Financial Issues. You know, we live in some volatile times, and one of the things that we should be concerned about is are the investments that I'm in honoring the Lord? Well, I try to do the best I can to make sure that the stocks and mutual funds on my list are the best out there, not only from a financial and fundamental standpoint, but that they wouldn't be displeasing to God. Would you consider being a partner with me at Financial Issues? For $85 a year, you're not only going to get my stock picks that I update every week, every Monday, and my economic commentary every Monday, along with an alert system and my asset allocation models that change as the economy changes so that you can do a great job reviewing and maybe actively managing your portfolios. Financialissues.org to partner with me in the ministry. Hello, Dan. I love your show, and just don't say I'm an idiot because I did not do what you said to do. I'm 61. I wanted to retire in a couple of years. Now, I had put aside about $37,000 all cash. It's in a brokerage fund, but it was just sitting there. So let me take about $25,000 and put it in some preferred stock, and I've lost about $3,000. Do I just hang tough with this? Do I just get out and put it in the bank to stay cash? First off, you're not an idiot, as you've said at all. <laughs> you know, we make decisions based on the good part of what what we hear, I would probably keep them. I appreciate everything that you give us on a daily basis. The opinions and recommendations expressed by Dan are his own and do not necessarily represent the opinions of this station or any of the show's sponsors.
Welcome back. Financial issues, 866-300-9298. Uh, oil is still above uh, 104. It's 104.15 right now. Uh, it's interesting because there's a, a recent report out, again, I saw in the Wall Street Journal this morning talking about uh, oil prices. Uh, I'm sorry, gasoline prices have peaked. And um, we're going to start seeing them come down. And that's going to be good for the economy. Well, guess what? Cap and trade being put in by the EPA is going to dramatically. Now, I don't know about where you live. I live in the state of Pennsylvania in the north, in the uh, eastern part uh, outside of Philadelphia. And I got notice that our electric bills, our electric um, uh, fees are going up. Now, I paid the highest electric bill I ever paid, ever dreamed. Didn't even know it was possible I could pay that much for an electric bill last, I don't know when it was, February or I don't know if it was January or February. And now, you know, that includes natural gas. It's in the same bill. But nonetheless, it's very high. Now they're talking about our electric prices going up. And this is going to continue uh, behind this idea of capping, uh, you know, uh, emissions. So what they're going to do is they're going to, you're going to start seeing carbons being traded. So uh, Southern Power in Georgia, who 21, they, they produce 21.8 metric tons of carbon emissions because they have a huge piece of coal that they're still using. Well, if the limits are set by the EPA of 19 billion for the state of Georgia, then the state of Georgia now is going to be allowed through this cap and trade system to be able to buy some carbon emissions from the state of Mississippi, who's lower, a lot lower. So if the state of Mississippi has any extra carbon emissions, they can sell it, key word here, sell it to Georgia. Georgia can buy it so that they can have some room since they're producing 21.8 tons. It's also going to force states, this is the whole idea, no it's not, it's some of the idea, they're going to force states to start thinking about green energy, of course, start thinking about the, the obviously, the conversion to natural gas, which has a lot less carbon emissions. So they're going to start seeing those conversions from coal. Again, this is, this is all putting the coal industry out of business here in the United States. And that's what we're going to start seeing. So now there is going to be a whole new uh, source of trade in carbon emissions. But more importantly, it's going to allow the federal government to first control the states and what the states are doing. It's going to give them enormous power over the states, and it's going to eventually lead to power over the citizens of a particular state because it is going to trickle down into the guy that's got a a three-man bakery shop that has to use an enormous amount of carbon emissions in order to bake bread or cakes or whatever it is they bake. And it's going to trickle down to that guy. Only that guy's not going to have the money to buy some carbon emissions from somebody else, and they'll be out of business. It is going to give, this is why I said way back when, it is the biggest power grab in social control. They'll be able to control, hey, sorry, can't heat that much. I know it's cold this winter, but... You got to crank it down and, you know, you know, uh, buy a sweater. I don't know what to tell you, but you can't, you can't have your heat that high. I mean, it's going to literally give an enormous amount of control over the American people. And we're just starting to see the beginning of it. So when I was on a uh, talk show in Phoenix, I remember it very well when the cap and trade bill was, was uh, denied, you know, was shot down. I said, it's going to be a nightmare because it isn't going to, go away and, and unless this president uh, gets out of office before they start implementing, but it's handed off to the EPA and it's going to be a huge problem. And these guys are calling me conspiracy theories, theorists and all that, all that kind of stuff. But, you know, um, I, I, I ended the conversation with the, it was two of them, two guys that were interviewing me. I ended the conversation with them is here's the problem with ev- all your listeners. I'm afraid they might think you're right. But I'm just saying to all your listeners, you're dead wrong and I'm right. And that's how we ended it. And um, I ought to call them and see if they want to interview me again. 
in light of this information. But it's, it, you know, <clears throat> it is, it's not going away and it's going to be a huge problem. And if we think Obamacare was an issue for a power grab and more uh, social control, we haven't seen anything compared to the likes of cap and trade. 866-392-98. Let me go to Nick. Nick's calling us from Illinois. Hey, Nick. Hey, Dan. It's an honor to talk to you. Thank you. I wanted to thank you for your ministry. I try to listen every day. Well, thank um, you, Nick. I just had a question, a couple questions, actually. Um, I was underemployed for a long time, and I racked up a lot of credit card debt. I mm. was uh, working two jobs, but still using the credit card for supplement. And I have tried to use some of your advice and uh, contacted the credit card companies, but none of them are willing to lower the interest rate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know uh, where I should proceed from there. And then the other question is, I am, uh, I have a better job now and uh, they have a 4% match and I'm fully matching the 4%. And I believe I'm in like the 2030 fund or something like that whatever the the yearly one is I'm 37 now okay so I think on that front if you're doing the four percent match and you're doing the 20 uh, 30 fund I think that's exactly where you ought to be uh, the only caution I'd give you on that Nick is when the market corrects things come down whatever you do don't stop putting your money into it regardless okay. of how concerned you get how scared you get, all the horror stories you hear, you've got to continue to contribute to it because that's what's going to benefit you the most. The contributions during that period of time of the market being down and the news being nothing but bad, they're, they're the contributions that are going to help you the most in the long run. So uh, that's the only caution I give you on that, but you're doing the right thing, and I'm glad you're doing that. As far as the credit card thing goes, you know, it's very disappointing, and I suspect that you weren't behind much on your payments. No, I'm not behind on yeah. any payment. So, so when you call them and you're not behind, they they have no reason. There's no incentive. And by the way, I'm not suggesting you get behind or anything like that. But I'm okay. just saying it's just so aggravating to me these credit card companies because they, you know, they're going to squeeze you for every drop of interest. And they do this over and over again. People call, say, look, I'm barely making it. I need some help. And they say, no, no, no. And then you know, uh, six months later, after you're in big trouble and you're not making it, then they all of a sudden want to work with you, of course, uh, because they don't want you to declare bankruptcy and then lose everything. But they're going to squeeze you. If they can get all that interest from you, they can. The best thing you can hope for, Nick, what I would continue to do, I mean, I would take every, you get a credit card offer in the mail that is 0% interest on, you know, the money that you transfer for the next six months or a year, do it. Get out of those cards uh, that are paying the high interest. Continue to work paying towards principal as much as you can, but it'd be a lot better if you can do it in a 0% interest rate. Um, six months from now, when the interest goes to somewhat normalized, you know, 11%, 12%, uh, then, you know, you may get another credit card offer. Roll it over again. I mean, I know that, you know, uh, just until you get them paid off, I would pick one of those credit card bills, uh, the one with the smallest amount, uh, not necessarily the lowest interest, but the smallest amount, and I would I would peck away at it till you get rid of it. Um, I would put all uh, additional principal or any additional discretionary income that you have towards that credit card and get rid of it, and then move on to the next one. But um, unfortunately, that's all you're going to be able to do because you managed through all that underemployment, and boy, I, I just uh, love you for that. I appreciate the fact that you're willing to do that. For all that underemployment, uh, you managed to stay on top of things, even though I'm sure it was a, it was a heartache and a strain. Uh, and, you know, so uh, I'm sure uh, knowing that, that you're more than disciplined to uh, plug away and get rid of these bills. So that's the best, the best thing I can tell you is just keep, just keep hitting it as hard as you can, Nick. All right. Well, thank you, Dan. I didn't know I've been getting those credit card offers. I didn't know if uh, I've done that in the past, but I didn't know if that was something you would recommend. So yeah, I absolutely. Appreciate it. Very yep. Much. You're welcome. Thank you, Nick. Uh, let me go to AJ. AJ Coyne is from Virginia. Hey, AJ. Hello. Yes, sir. 
Yes, good morning, and I thank you for the service that you're doing. Thank you. I just want a, uh, to know, what is your Timothy Fund? I hear you refer to it often, mm-hmm. and where can I buy it? So, Timothy is like any mutual fund company. They are a mutual fund company is all they are. And uh, but they're biblically responsible, so they don't they don't put any companies that aren't that are that are participating in abortion, pornography, um, you know, embryonic stem cell research, all those things that would be offensive to God. They're not participating in those companies. They have twelve different mutual funds, and. Um, the way you can find out about them is you can call them. I'll give you the number as soon as I can find it. Um, I'll, I'll give you the number and you can call them and you know, they, they can, they can help you get started if that's something that you want to do. Okay. Stock exchange. Pardon me. Uh, I missed that AJ. Hey. Is it traded on the stock market? Yes, it's just like all mutual funds. Uh, you know that you can you can uh, you know buy them uh, through your broker or uh, whatever else you might have. Um, but yeah, they're they're um, you know registered mutual funds, okay. so they have they have a symbol I'm- and you can trade them. I am I'm familiar with Vanguard. Would they know about it? Van, if you have a Vanguard brokerage account, then certainly they know about it and would be happy to put those funds in your account. Um, if you have a um, if you have a a, a Vanguard money, uh, a Vanguard mutual fund, and you want to add these mutual funds, they, they you probably can't do that. It depends on the Vanguard account that you have. Okay, but I have a brokerage. Oh, you have a brokerage, yeah. So absolutely, they can do it. They can do okay. it. Yep. And I'll give you uh, the Vanguard. Uh, I'll give you the uh, Timothy phone number anyway. Uh, it's 800-846-7529. That's 800-846-7526. And you can call uh, Timothy if Vanguard can't help you. Thank you, AJ. I appreciate the call. I appreciate you listening. Let me go to Debbie. By the way, 866-300-9298. That's our call in line. If you got a question or comment, you want to know a little bit of something that you've heard about the economy, give us a call, 866-300-9298. Let me go to Debbie in Ohio. Hi, Debbie. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for taking my call. Sure. I've heard you recommend um, transferring from traditional IRAs and 401ks to Roth. My husband and I are uh, 55 and 54, uh, respectively, Mm -hmm. and um, just wonder what the benefit of doing that is. Well, the benefit of it is the downside is, of course, you know, paying the taxes. Right. Uh, the the uh, and it, and it may be too much to do that with, so maybe you do just some of it. The benefit of it is that that money grows tax free forever. There's never going to be any taxes on that money. You can hand it down into your estate without any taxes due on it, so you don't have to worry about getting it out of the traditional IRA before it gets to your kids. So that's the other uh, huge benefit of it. Uh, so it's all, all the real benefit is around the tax-free status that you maintain. You can make contributions at any age. You never have to take a withdrawal. Uh, the traditional IRA at 70 and a half, you've got to take at least a minimum distribution. Uh, the Roth IRA, you don't ever have to do that. Uh, you don't ever have to take a distribution for as long as you live. And so there is a lot more benefits to it. And uh, so if you can't afford all the taxes in one year, then transfer some of it. You know, you can make a transfer, roll over, uh, you know, a piece of your existing IRA into a Roth. And that might be a good strategy for you, Debbie. So hopefully that helps. I'm right up against the hour here. We'll be back uh, after these breaks. You're listening to 
Financial Issues. I'm Dan Celia. And you know, we're here every day at this time. We're trying to help you be the best steward you can be with all that God has blessed you with.